Okay, so this is lecture 25 of number theory. So what we're going to be doing today is we will be doing Hensel's lemma, which is basically leading into the p-adics and trying to find ways of solving a lot of these equations. For those of you who are interested and enjoy stuff like this, you know, commutative algebra and algebraic number theory would be very good classes to consider taking next year. We have a lot of people who are teaching things along those lines. So let's just do a little bit along the example we started last time. And I want to just use the example from the book so that you can go back quickly. So it was x cubed minus 15x squared plus 11x plus 42 equals 0. And we decided we would study this equation mod 2. Why mod 2? Why would we choose 2 as our prime? Why not 17? Two is easy. It's the smallest prime. You know, let's try to do things there. There's fewer choices there. And so when we looked at it in mod 2, we got x cubed plus x plus x squared plus x equals 0. This gave us x equals 0 mod 2. We then looked at it in mod 2 squared, and we got x cubed and then negative 15 is the same as plus x squared. Uh, we're looking at it mod 4. So 11 would be the same as 3, right? And then 42 would be 2. And so we were trying to expand on our solution of x0. And so we were trying x equals 0 plus b times 2. And when we're writing a number mod 4, we would write it as you know, some multiple of 1 plus some multiple of 2. And when we plugged this in, we ended up getting uh, mod 4, 2b, when I cube that, that's going to be 0 mod 4. When I squared, it's going to be 0 mod 4. So we got you know, 6b plus 2 equals 0 mod 4. So what does that tell us about b? So what's the only b that would work? So we only have two candidates for e. This is why we're choosing the prime of 2. So if we put in b equals 0, we get 2 is equal to 0 mod 4. If we put in b equals 1, we get 8 equals 0 mod 4. So b must equal 1. So we know the solution is 0 plus 1 times 2 mod 4. Building on the success, let's look at this equation mod 2 cubed. We have x cubed. Well, negative 15, I can still add 16 to that because 16 is 0 mod 8. So this is going to be plus x squared. Now when I'm looking at things mod 8, 11x becomes 3. And what about 42 mod 8? That's still going to be 2. And so we want this to equal 0 mod 8. And now we'll have x is 0 plus 1 times 2 plus b times 2 squared. And we're just trying to find the next term in the series expansion. We're now expanding in terms of powers of 2. So when we put this in, when we cube this, ugh, now we have to be a little bit more careful. Do we have to worry about the cube term? You know, we've got 2 plus 4b. Do we have to worry about the cube term mod 8? No. no. This is an even number, so when I cube it, it's going to be 2 times 2 times 2 no matter what. So we don't have to worry about the cubic term. The quadratic term, we do have to worry about depending on whether or not b is 0 or 1 mod 4. As a difference between whether or not b is 0 or 1. So I have two possibilities. One is I could just put this in and expand. Or I could just say, well, 
you know, I've only got two choices for B. Let's put in B equals 0. Let's put in B equals 1. Let's see which one works. It's good to know that there are two different ways we can do it. It's good to explore both ways. Which do you think is better, putting in 2 plus 4B, squaring it, and then trying to solve, or just putting in the two different values? I think the two values is easier here. I mean, otherwise, I'm going to be getting the quadratic equation. I can do the two values. If I take b equals 0, what will I get? I'll get 4 plus 6 plus 2 equals 0 mod 8. And if I take b equals 1, then my number is 6. So I would get 36 plus 6 times 3 is 18 plus 2 equals 0 mod 8. All right. This is 12. Is 12 congruent to 0 mod 8? No. So this is a big no over here. And what about this one? This is 20, uh, 56. And this is a yes. And so then we get solution is x is 0 plus 1 times 2 plus 1 times 2 squared. And this will get us a solution to this equation mod 8. This is now lather, rinse, repeat. We now try to solve this mod 2 to the 4th, 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 6th. So what would be your first hope? So if you had a hope for something, yes? Yeah, so one hope would be maybe they would stabilize. And that, you know, from some point onward, all the additional coefficients are zero. If there's an integer solution to this, then the solution will stabilize. Yes? In this case, wouldn't you only have to go to the, to the fifth? Because then everything, it would be like mod 64, and then it wouldn't matter because everything is mod 64. Or, no, never mind, because you have the negative 15. So we have the negative 15. Um, but that's an interesting question. When you look at something like this, can you prove, just by looking at the coefficients, that beyond a certain point, there won't be any changes? They won't be able to impact? Does the negative make that harder? So that's a good thing to think about for something like this. Another thing to think about as we're doing this is, it could be possible that there's always a solution, mod 2, 2 squared, 2 cubed, 2 to the fourth, but there may not be an integer solution. Will we always be able to find another term? So here we just actually did the calculation. And we saw additional terms coming out, and we found that we could take the next one. The question is, will this method always work? So what we could do is we could try to do this in general, is imagine we have a solution up to a certain point could we get the next term? And if so, what would we need to get the next term? So, you know, again, there's a lot of choices one has in how to present this material. I'm choosing to go through an example in great detail and try to use that to then motivate Hensel's lemma rather than just writing, by divine inspiration, assume the following conditions hold. Here's the solution. Here's how to do it. So let's take this one and let's assume we can solve, solve up to... 2 to the n. <coughs> so we have some solution. x equals the sum. We'll call it maybe bk 2 to the k. k goes from 0 to n minus 1. So this is a solution. And it solves our polynomial f of x is congruent to 0 mod 2 to the n. And then the goal is to find b such that, uh, let's call it y equals x plus b, and then what power should go after the b? So what power do I want of 2? Yn plus 
So n plus 1 is one of the three candidates oh, you could guess. B. We're finding B. Okay, n minus 1 is also one of the three candidates. There's one other candidate that hasn't been mentioned. n minus 1 is a candidate, n plus 1 is a candidate. There's one last candidate, okay. n. So I will tell you it is one of either n minus 1, n, or n plus 1. Any thoughts? Which of the three? I'm sorry? Okay, why n minus 1? We're assuming that we've solved it up to 2n, that we've solved this as congruent to 0 mod 2 to the n. We want to find b such that this is a solution to f of x congruent to 0 mod 2 to the n plus 1. So over here, when we were trying to solve it mod 2 squared, we went up one less. When we did 2 cubed, we went up one less. So here, if we want to do it to 2 to the n plus 1, what power should we go up to? Just n. Just n. Another way of seeing it is, over here, we went up to n minus 1 when we were looking at x. You know, our solution mod 2 to the n, we went up to the 1 power less. If I'm looking at things up to 16, I write it as either 0 1 1s plus 0 1 2s plus 0 1 4s plus 0 1 8s. I don't need any 16s. So I would stop at 2 to the n. So the question is, can we find such a y? And so now, let's go through and see what happens. So now we have our function is x cubed minus 15x squared plus 11x plus 42. And we want that to be congruent to 0 mod 2 to the n plus 1. So now we put in y is x plus b times 2 to the n cubed minus 15, uh, sorry. So it's probably bad notation to be saying x in both places. Um, <coughs> let's, let's call this y. And then we'll try to find you know, a y tilde. y, y plus b 2 to the n plus 11, y plus b 2 to the n plus 42 equals 0 mod 2 to the n plus 1. All right, a lot of algebra. What do you think we should be trying to do now? How? How should we simplify? Right. But how, how should we simplify this? What's the, what's the basic thing you would do if you got this back in high school or junior high school? When you see something like this, what would you do? Distribute. Yeah, distribute. Expand everything out. And when we expand things out, we can use Pascal's triangle, which fortunately we talked about yesterday. And we would have four terms from this, uh, three terms here. Let's ask which terms really matter. We've got a 2 to the n. If I cube that, I'll have a 2 to the 3n. What can you say about 2 to the 3n versus 2 to the n plus 1. Let's assume n is at least 1. So if I look at the cube term, you know, I'll have a b cubed 2 to the 3n, but I'm looking at things mod 2 to the n plus 1. Do I have to worry about such a term? You know, as long as n is at least 1, if n was 0, OK, I'd have to worry about it. But as long as n is at least 1, this will be 3n, this will be 2n. I subtract n. This is 2 to the 2n versus 2. 2 to the 2n wins. I don't have to worry about the cube of this term. Do I have to worry about the square of this term? Do I have to worry about the you know, b squared 
2 to the 2n term versus 2 to the n plus 1. If n is 1, I've got 2 versus 2, drops out. If n is 2, I've got 4 versus 2, drops I'm sorry, 4 versus 3, drops out. If n is 3, I have 6 versus 4, drops out. I don't have to worry about the quadratic term. Do I have to worry about the linear term? Will that survive? Yes, because the exponent here now is smaller than this. So when I expand this out, a lot of the terms turn out not to matter. So we will get y cubed plus 3yb2 to the n, and then everything else is insignificant. For the next one, it's minus 15 uh, y. The, uh, the cross term is going to be 2yb2 to the n. And then do I have to worry about the quadratic? No. Plus 11y plus b2 n plus 42 can go into 0, 2 to the n plus 1. And we're assuming n is greater than or equal to 1. I claim there's actually one term here that we can also throw away immediately, that we lucked out. Which term can we throw away? Yeah, the 2 reinforces the 2 to the n, and this term drops out. So we don't have to worry about this term here. The 3yb to the 2n, we could actually do something nice to the 3. What can we do to the 3? Yeah, we can write it as 2 plus 1. The 2 is not going to matter. And then what I would like to do is I'd like to just collect all the y's together because we know something about that. So we could have a y cubed. Well, let's do all the y's that don't have a b with it. So we'll have you know y cubed minus 15y. Oh, it should be 15y squared, yes. 15y squared uh, plus 11y plus 42. And now the next stuff is I'm going to have y b 2 to the n. I don't need, I don't have any b's from this. I'll have over here plus 11 b 2 to the n is congruent to 0 mod 2 to the n plus 1. We're trying to solve this. Do we are trying to find the b that works. OK. So if we look at this part over here, this is going to be 11 plus y 2 to the n b. What about this part? What do we know about this? That's our original question. So what do we know by assumption about this? It's 0. Be more specific. Zero, mo it's 0 mod 2 to the n. So we can write this as some number times 2 to the n. So this is equal to c times 2 to the n, where c is either 0 or 1. Well, c could be more than just 0 1, but because we're reducing the whole thing mod 2 to the n plus 1, if you know, c was equal to 7, I could write 7 as 4 plus 2 plus 1. The 4 would no longer matter because it would drop out. So really, I only care is c 0 or 1. All right, so now if I look at all of this, I'm going to get c plus 11 plus y times b times 2 to the n is congruent to 0 mod 2 to the n plus 1. Is this going to be solvable?
Wait a minute. Um, this is a B squared over here. Sorry, right? This is a B squared, right? Because I was just looking right now and I'm going, uh, there's multiple solutions here. This is not good. Oh, wait a minute. Um, this, oh, no, no, this is y cubed. Y it's, it's a y squared, right? So we have a y squared over there, which we dropped. So this should be a y squared over here. So this should be, right? And then this one becomes a y squared over here. Just when we expanded this out, we had y cubed plus 3y squared times this to the first power. <coughs> so we, we, we just dropped the y squared. We can cancel that 11 from yesterday. We can cancel what? We can say 11 is 10 plus 1. We can say 11 is 10 plus 1. And so we could reduce this to 1. And so, you know, y is now a nice, you know, fixed number. So will this be solvable? Okay, well, wh what are the possible values for b? Zero. And one. So this seems to be telling us that you know if we take zero, we're always going to get something that works. So there's there's got to be an, oh okay. So here's the algebra mistake. All right, now I see where the algebra mistake is. So we're fine up to here but then there was an error going from this line to this line. There's no B multiplying this. And that was the algebra mistake. All right, so we said that this should be a Y squared over here. And so now what we get is it's 2 to the N. We can pull out the 2 to the N from everything, but it's going to be C plus 11 plus y squared b is congruent to 0 mod 2 to the n plus 1. So that was the algebra mistake. We pushed that parentheses too far. So now, I'm not always going to get a solution for any value of b. Well, if I want this to be 0 mod 2 to the n plus 1, I've got a 2 to the n over here, so what does this have to be? has to be 0 mod 2. So what we need is we want b to equal negative c divided by 11 plus y squared. And I'll put the divided in quotes. I'm not really dividing by these numbers. What I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to solve this equation mod 2. So if this is odd, and this is odd, then b should be even. If this is even, and this is odd, what happens? Well, let's, let's write this down carefully. So we've now gotten to the point where we want c plus 11 plus y squared. we can go into 0 mod 2 and b is 0 and 1. So we can look at c 11 plus y squared and b. So if they're both 0, if they're both even, what can you say about b? Can be free. If c is even and that's odd, has to be even. If it's odd, even, so if C is odd and this is even, what, ba what B works? None. 
And finally, if they're both odd, so what would V have to be? V would have to be odd. So there are four possible cases. In one case, we actually have no solution. Things break down. In another case, we have exactly one solution. In another case, we have exactly one solution. And in another case, we actually have two solutions. Could it be surprising that there are two solutions? Would you be shocked if I gave you an equation that had two solutions? No. It's possible for equations to have multiple solutions, right? There could be more than one integer that satisfies what we're looking for. So doing a quick analysis like this gives us a sense of what's going on. The difficulty is always recognizing what is happening. The 11 plus y squared, what is 11 plus y squared telling us? Where does 11 plus y squared come from? So remember, why was our solution to the original problem mod a lower value? So it's not, a, it's not that clear when you're looking at it right now, I think, what the 11 plus y squared is coming from. But when you're looking at a polynomial and you, you know, you've got a cubic x cubed minus 15x squared plus 11x plus 42 equals 0, and I'm giving you something involving a y squared, what might you be thinking of? What related polynomial? The derivative. Why derivative? You're close, but we were starting off with a cubic x cubed minus 15x squared, and we're ending up with something involving a y squared. Well, I'm, I'm trying to give you, you know, most of you are never going to use Hensel's lemma in your life. And I cannot lie and sit at the blackboard or stand at the blackboard and talk about how this is a material you need to master. You're not going to use this. Unless you take algebraic number theory, in which case you'll use it for another semester, and then you won't ever use it again for the rest of your life. Unless you decide to go to grad school and work in an area like this, in which case you'll use it. The probability of this happening, that you'll be using Hensel's lemma one year from now, is almost zero. <laughs> Even five weeks from now is almost zero. So the question is, why are we spending time learning something like Hensel's lemma? So one is if you know where to go if you ever have a situation where you need to use Hensel's lemma. You've at least heard of it. You know of the technique. Or why we care about it. Or why we care about it. Why some people might choose to study that if your friends are doing a thesis for next year. And you can, oh, no. But the real thing is, how do you look at problems? How do you attack things? This is why I wanted to talk about the log 5 method. You know, A wins P percent of their games. B wins Q percent of the games. What's the probability A beats B? How do you look at equations and get a sense of what they're talking about? And so when we're trying to look here, when we're trying to figure out, you know, will this method work, what's the possible obstruction? Yeah. The possible obstruction is when this element is not invertible mod 2. So if this element is invertible mod 2, then what we would have is just b is equal to negative c 1 plus y squared, I'm sorry, 11 plus y squared inverse mod 2, right? If this element is invertible, we can just solve. And there'll be a unique solution. So what does it mean for this to be invertible? It means it's 1. And if you look at those cases, um, so... So we're saying if C is even and this is 1, we said that there were no solutions for B. 
Isn't it one solution? Do I might have just written. Oh, oh, I, 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 I'm writing. I'm writing the solution is b is equal to zero, and here b equals one. Okay, I feel better now. So, in this case, there is a solution. There's a unique solution. If this is invertible, here's the next solution. If this is not invertible, then it all depends on what c is. If c is odd, there's no solutions. If c is even, then any value of b works. So the question is trying to come up with a nice condition. How can we tell when we can pass from one solution to one with an additional digit? And then if we have one with an additional digit, can we pass to one with an additional digit after that? So in Hensel's lemma, uh, I, I will state Hensel's lemma on the board now, and then I will state the uh, lemma we're going to use to prove it. What we do not want to do is constantly have to come up with new conditions to check as we keep marching down and down and down. You know, we could have an extremely painful condition that involves a solution going up to you know, b to the n, and then check something new and get a solution for b going up uh, 2 to the n plus 1, and then check something new to get something to 2 to the n plus 2. It would be wonderful if there was one condition we could check in the beginning that would tell us the process always continues. And so this is Hensel's lemma. So we're going to say the following. f of x is a polynomial with integer coefficients. Um, and p is a prime. Suppose f of a is congruent to 0 mod, I think they're doing p to the n, OK. Then there exists, have you seen this notation? Exists followed by an exclamation point. This means there exists a unique. There's only one solution. There exists a unique b in 0, 1, p minus 1, such that f of a plus b p to the n is congruent to 0 mod p to the n plus 1. Um, uh, and b is equal to negative f of a over p to the n f prime of a mod p, there's, OK, provided, OK. So what do you think the condition is? So what condition do you think must be true for this to work? Yes? Well, f prime of a would have to not be a multiple of p. f prime of a would have to not be a multiple of p, provided p does not divide f prime of a. So it's the only condition that would make sense if I'm giving you an expression like this. So f prime of a is going to be an integer. And what we're basically saying is we want the first derivative not to be a multiple of p. If it's not a multiple of p, what can you tell me about it mod p squared? It's not zero. Yeah, it's not zero. Or and it's not all, and it's also not p mod p squared. What about mod p cubed? It can't be 0, can't be multiple p, can't be multiple p squared. So if we have this nice condition that p does not divide f prime of a, this is something that's going to stay nice as we go higher and higher and higher. It's not going to be new things that we have to keep checking. There's just one thing that we have to check. At the very beginning, does p divide f prime of a? And if it does, we're out of luck. If it doesn't, then we actually have a way to get the next term. What do you think we should do if, unfortunately, f prime of a is a multiple of p? Pick a, Pick a number. Pick a number.
make a different peak, right? There's more than one prime in the world. Right? We like two. Two is a nice small prime. But if two doesn't work, what should you try? Three. What else? Five. So is it possible that there will always be a prime that works? Wait, functions that have no primes that work? So can anybody think of a function where no prime works? Oh, I know. Zero. I'm sorry? Zero. Ah, so if the first derivative is identically zero, if the first derivative vanishes, then we are... Sure, I was debating whether or not I wanted to say something stronger, but doomed is a fine word. Right? If the first derivative vanishes, we're in trouble. What would it mean if the first derivative vanishes? F is constant. Not if it's constant. I mean, I could give you, for instance, x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 2x plus 1 to the hundredth power. Any root of this is going to be a root of multiplicity 100. It means you have to have repeated roots. So when I'm trying to solve you know, f of x equals 0, if I have a repeated root, then both f and f prime vanish at the same place. Right? So you know, if I give you f of x is you know, x minus a squared times g of x, then f prime of x is going to be 2x minus a g of x plus x minus a squared g prime of x. So we'll see that you know, if we have a repeated root, sadly, the function and the derivative both vanish at the same point. So as long as our function does not have a repeated root, we're OK. Or we just can't be looking at what's going on at that repeated root. OK. And then there's a, algebra, there's a very simple polynomial lemma that we're going to use in the proof. And the lemma is the following. f as before, then we can write f of x plus y equals f of x plus f prime at x times y plus some new function xy times y squared. So this is just a lemma on polynomials that we need. If you think about what's going on, f is a polynomial, has integer coefficients. f prime is going to be a polynomial that has integer coefficients. When I expand this out for each of these terms, I'm going to use the binomial theorem term by term by term. I can then correct whatever I'm getting wrong from here by adjusting this appropriately, and all the remaining terms are going to have at least a y squared. So the proof is, is fairly straightforward algebra. It's in the book. But if you just think about what's going on, we have you know, f is the sum of you know, a n, x minus, I'm sorry, x to the n, expand things out with the binomial theorem term by term by term, collect all the things that don't have any y's, that's this. Look at all the things that have y's to the first power. That should probably be this. Or if not, it's something we can easily tweak a little. You know, it, 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 should, it should be exactly this. It'll be exactly this uh, when we look at all things that have y to the first power. And then everything that's left over will have at least a y squared. OK, why would this be useful? Well, if we start going through what we have over here, the idea is that we can use this to analyze our function. So let's now prove Hensel. OK, so let's look at, we know f of a is congruent to 0 mod p to the n. Let's look at f of a plus p to the n. What do you think we should use to understand f of a plus p to the n? You know, the lemma that I just wrote up. This is, notice that this is very similar to what we were doing before. This is similar to what we did in calculus. We want to understand x, 
f of x plus h minus f of x over h, take the limit as h goes to 0. You have the h squared terms, which aren't going to really matter. And so this is going to be equal to f of a plus f prime of a times, oh, this should be b p to the n, times b p to the n plus g of x, y. Um, so it will be a, b, p to the n, p to the 2n. OK? If you think about how we were talking about things with the p-adics before, the higher power of prime you have, the smaller you are. <laughs> so if you want to think about this calculus-wise, you know, f of x plus h minus f of x over h, the h squared h cubed terms are insignificant when you divide by h because they still survive. So if you want to look at this in the point of view of calculus, the higher and higher, higher power of p is equivalent to a small and small and small and small number. So now when we look at this mod p to the n plus 1, this is going to be f of a, so we plus f prime of a b p to the n plus 0 mod p to the n plus 1. What's the only danger? What's the only danger? n is less than 1. You know, if n equals 0, there's a danger. But if n equals 0, what is going on? You know, we're supposed to be starting off our initial study where we wanted to study this mod p to the n, and we're trying to get the next level, right? We're assuming we've done some case. And so if we had n equals 0, fine, the next one would be n plus 1. If we take n equals 0, we're just trying to solve f of a equals 0 mod 1. We're supposed to be studying this mod of prime. What's the smallest n we can take? 1. Right? If we take n equals 0, we're trying to solve f of a is congruent to 0 mod 1. Is it hard to solve an equation with integer coefficients mod 1? It's an integer. Right? So we have n is greater than or equal to 1. So we actually don't have to worry about what would happen if n equals 0. We can't have n equals 0. It's too easy to solve integer equations and integers um, just being congruent to 0 mod 1. All right, so we don't have to worry about those terms. So we want this to be, so if, you know, find b such that f of a plus f prime of a b p to the n is congruent to 0 mod p to the n plus 1. We know that this is a multiple of p to the n. And we only care about that multiple mod p. So we're almost in the situation where we can just solve for b. This looks a lot like a linear equation in b. And if you just did things formally, you would say, well, b is equal to negative f of a divided by f prime of a p to the n. Right? If you were to just solve this using high school algebra, that's what you would do. All we have to do now is interpret this with congruences. So in terms of what's really going on here, what do we mean by dividing? We mean by looking at the multiplicative inverse. So over here, this is a multiple of p to the n. So if I want to explain this out slowly, let's say f of a is equal to c p to the n mod p to the n plus 1 and c will be in 0, 1, p minus 1. Because I don't care about extra multiples of p or p squared or p cubed, right? 
I'm only looking at this equation mod p to the n plus 1. So as long as I write f of a as some multiple of p to the n, I just here is the coefficient between 0 and p minus 1. I could add p to it, 2p to it, uh, p to the p to it. Not going to change things. So now if I use that, I would get p to the n c plus f prime of a times b. This can go into 0 mod p to the n plus 1. So I would get b times f prime of a is equal to negative c mod p to the n plus 1. I'm sorry, um, this is now just mod p, sorry. This is mod p to the n plus 1, but down here this is now just mod p. I've got my p to the n over here. This has to be multiple of p. We're assuming f prime of a is not 0 mod p. And now you can see why that condition comes in. And so now we get b is equal to negative c times f prime of a inverse <coughs> mod p. And of course, we can replace c by anything as long as we're only adding powers of p. We could replace c now with f of a, because that's only going to change by putting in extra powers of p. So you get b is equal to negative c f of a f prime of a inverse mod p. And so there's Hensel's lemma. If there is a solution, mod p to the n, you can get a solution mod p to the n plus 1, and it's unique. So once you start off with one solution, there's going to be a unique chain so long as f prime of a is not 0 mod p. So again, what I particularly like about this is this allows us to go back to some of the other things we've seen before, this local to global idea. We saw this with the generating functions and the Fibonacci numbers. You start off with local information, you bundle it, and you get this global object. We saw this with the series expansions for differential equations. You know, we start off, we find things at each place, and we bundle it up. Now, the nice thing is in the differential equations, when we bundled it up, at the end of the day, we actually recognized, uh, I think we got sine x and cosine x for the example we did in class. We recognized it as some standard functions. So the question is, when you bundle things up like this, can you recognize this new infinite sum, this new p-adic sum, as something that exists? That's something you're familiar with. If the infinite sum terminates, then yes. If it terminates, it's just going to be an integer. The question is, what happens if it doesn't terminate? This is a different completion of the rationals. You know, we're used to the real numbers where we have the standard absolute value. You can use the p-adic absolute value, which is related to what we're doing here, and get another set of numbers. This is called the p-adic. We're not going to go into more detail than this. This is, I think, more than enough for first course in number theory. But what I really love about this is the complete deterministic. And it's one simple condition to test in the beginning. It would be horrible if every single time we had a new condition to test so that we wouldn't know if it's going to work ahead of time. So maybe it works for the first 2,000 values of n, and then something strange happens and the method breaks down. What's nice is you can tell at the very beginning, is it going to work? And as long as you don't have a double root, are you OK? If the root's not double, will you be OK? Yeah, I'll leave that as an exercise. You know, just figure out if you do have a double root, you could be in trouble. If you don't have a double root, it's a good idea to just you know, quickly make sure that you can rigorously prove that it won't matter. All right, so this is a good place to stop. There is no class on Friday because of the second midterm, and there's no class on Monday because of Alaska Air. Yeah.